Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Admiral James Stavridis to discuss his newest book, To Risk It All, Nine Conflicts and the Crucible of Decision, published by our friends at Penguin Press. Admiral Jim Stavridis spent more than 30 years in the U.S. Navy, rising to the rank of four-star admiral. He was Supreme Allied Commander at NATO and previously commanded U.S. Southern Command, overseeing military operations through Latin America. At sea, he commanded a Navy destroyer, a destroyer squadron, and an aircraft carrier battle group in combat. He holds a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where he recently served five years as dean. He received 50 medals in the course of his military career, including 28 from foreign nations. He has published 11 other books, including 2034, a novel of the next world war with Elliot Ackerman, and is chief international analyst for NBC News and a contributing editor for Time Magazine. He is currently vice chair, global affairs, and managing director of the Carlisle Group and the chair of the board of the Rockefeller Foundation. Whew, that is a lot. Unbelievable. We're so thrilled to have him with us today. For today's program, the Admiral will speak for about 20 minutes, and then we will open up the floor to questions from the audience. You can post your questions below in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen anytime throughout the broadcast. Thank you for ordering your copy of To Risk It All from Books and Books and supporting independent bookstores. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Admiral to the virtual stage. Hey, hello, hello everybody, and hello, Coral Gables in Miami. Um, as, uh, and thank you for a wonderful introduction. I spent uh, three years uh, in Coral Gables, living on Granada, right around the corner from the Biltmore Hotel. Um, and I was actually born in South Florida, just north and West Palm Beach. So even if I have to do this virtually, it's wonderful to kind of be with friends, be with family, be with uh, South Florida. So thanks for having me. Um, every weekend that I lived in Coral Gables, Books and Books was a mandatory stop for me. So I know there are many uh, fans of independent bookstores and Books and Books perennially is one of the top in the country. So thanks for having me. Um, this is my 12th book. And, you know, it's a little different than what I've written before. It's called To Risk It All, Nine Conflicts in the Crucible of Decision. So the idea of the book is pretty simple. It's that all of us in our lives hit moments where we have to make big, hard decisions. And generally, you get some time to make those decisions. You don't have to decide in five minutes who you're going to marry. You spend, you know, hopefully some number of months, maybe a year, maybe a few years deciding about marriage. Uh, career changes. You have generally lots of time to think about that. You can go back to mentors. You can talk to your parents. You can think about it. You can discuss it with your peers. Most big decisions you have a lot of time to make. But occasionally, there comes a decision that happens now, now, now. And of course, in the military, we face those decisions in combat. Our police and firemen face those decisions, often day after day after day. We ought to salute them. But occasionally, in the course of a normal civilian life, you will face a decision like that, perhaps when you least expect it. And we need, tragically, look no further than this series of horrific mass shootings in the United States. In a mass shooting, you have to make a decision right now. Are you going to flee? 
Are you going to hide? Are you going to sprint out of a place? Are you going to charge a gunman because you have no other good option? Are you going to shield a child? Are you going to escort an elder out of a, a conflicted space? One example, Miami, beautiful beaches. Suppose you're standing on a beach. You're a pretty good swimmer. It's late in the day. There's no lifeguard there. Out to sea, 30 yards out, you see someone clearly struggling, hands in the air, screaming, yelling, up and down, in and out of the water. What are you going to do? Are you going to frantically dial 911? Are you going to run into the water and try and drag that person in? Are you going to simply watch? There's no right answer to these questions. And as you drive by a terrible automobile accident, or you are in a line of ATVs on a summer vacation in Montana, and one of those ATVs goes spiraling down the side of a valley, and crashes. Are you going to go down and do what you can when someone has a compound fracture in front of you? Again, no right answer to these questions. But the premise of the book, to risk it all, is that A, these decisions will come for many of us in normal civilian life, and B, we can prepare for those moments. We can learn from others who have faced similar moments. And that's the frame of the book, To Risk It All. It's a story of nine individuals who literally risk it all in a gripping moment when they have to make a decision now, now, now. So I'm a Navy officer, as, as you heard in that introduction, I spent almost four decades in the military, plenty of time in combat. I've had my share of hard decisions. So in writing about how anyone ought to approach a challenging decision, I began with that frame. I began with the idea of Navy, combat, and history. So the book is framed around nine stories. I think pretty good stories, compelling stories of men and women who find themselves in this crucible of decision. And it starts at the very beginning of the American Navy with John Paul Jones fighting a revolutionary war battle and proceeds through the war against the Barbary pirates. It goes into the Civil War, goes into the Second World War, a couple of stories there. It has a chapter from the Korean War. There's a wonderful story about the first African-American woman to become an admiral, Michelle Howard, and her rescue of Captain Phillips. Maybe you saw that movie, the story of a rescue of a captain of a merchant ship from Somali pirates. And believe me, Admiral, Rear Admiral Michelle Phillips didn't have a lot of time to make those decisions. She had to decide now, now, now. She decided to risk it all. In this case, the life of the hostage came out well, could have come out badly. And then the final story is torn from the headlines just a year or two ago, 2020, the U.S. Navy aircraft carrier Roosevelt infected with COVID. The captain has to decide now what to do. Keep the ship at sea, bring it into port, send a message to the Navy saying, I can't keep operating with COVID ripping through my crew. So these are nine, I think, really hard decisions. And in telling the story of each of these, I think, very compelling figures, I lay out a case for how you can prepare yourself for that moment where you might have to risk it all. You might have to make a very hard decision. And I talk about how the different characters in the book have used their own intuition 
They use the gathering of information and intelligence, how they weigh the outcomes, both good and bad, how they use determination. Think today of President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine. He's deciding now, 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 big, big bets on his nation's future. Big part of what he's doing is using determination. You could drop a plumb line from John Paul Jones in the Revolutionary War to Volodymyr Zelensky. I talk in the book about the need to understand the resources you have available in the moment. The need to be able, and this is interesting and controversial, to change your mind. What if you take one course of action, but decide this isn't working? You have to be able to change. So you can be very determined at the start of one of these challenges, but you also need to be able to change your mind. So we talk about in the book some of those kinds of factors. And then finally, the essence of the book is, is really pretty simple. If you end up in a moment where you have to risk it all, in the case of a mass shooting, in the case of a drowning, in the case of an automobile accident, in the case of a medical decision you have to make at an instant's notice at the bedside of a relative, when you hit that point, three things can sustain you. Number one, know what you value. Know what really matters to you. And don't try and decide that in the moment of crisis. Number two, know yourself. Know what your limits are. Know what your level of physical fitness is. Know what your ability is in a moment of crisis. Know yourself. And number three, and I'll wrap up with this and turn it over to our moderator to kind of steer some questions. You need to have some heroes. You need to pick out who are people you really admire because in understanding who your heroes are and who you deeply admire, often comes the advice you need to steer through one of these moments of extreme risk. So here's a, a homework assignment that you can do or not. It's your choice. There's no grade on this. But some night, some quiet night, instead of turning on HBO, sit back with a pad of paper and write down the names of five or six people you really admire. And they can be people from history. Maybe you admire Abraham Lincoln or Rosa Parks. They can be characters in novels. Maybe you admire Atticus Finch, the lawyer in To Kill a Mockingbird. Maybe you admire a Greek hero in the story of the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae, Gates of Fire, the Spartan general Leonides. Maybe you admire one or two fictional characters. Maybe you admire a big political figure, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who led this nation out of the Great Depression, who led us through the Second World War. Whoever it is you admire, and it could be someone as close as your father. Top of my list is my dad, Marine Colonel George Stavridis, who showed me the path to national service, who helped me understand how important it is to be that individual in crisis who allows time to slow down, to make the right decisions. Your list could include your Uncle Fred, your Aunt Minnie, your father. Write that list down. And then next to their names, those five or six names, ask yourself, what do I admire about these people? And think about perhaps a real challenge or crisis that they faced. And then here's the hard part of the homework assignment. In that third column, write down, how am I doing? Would I be as courageous as Simon Bolivar 
in liberating six countries in Latin America? Would I be as good a father as my father, George Stavridis? Would I be as willing to break glass ceilings like Condi Rice? Whoever you admire and why you admire them, ask yourself, how would I do in that situation? And I think that'll help you prepare for these moments. And I hope you never face one where you have to literally risk it all. Again, the title of the book, To Risk It All, Nine Conflicts and the Crucible of Decision. I think it provides some lessons for when and if you have to face a moment where you have to risk it all. So with that, uh, thank you for taking uh, a bit of time with me. I wish I was in books and books. I've done many presentations there. This is my 12th book. Um, for my next book, which is another novel, I promise I'll come in person back to Coral Gables. Over we're to gonna, you, Christina. We're going, we're going to hold you to that. And just to break the ice, I'll start because there, I'm going to give people a chance to post some questions, please. Um, but I'll start with President Obama. That's someone I deeply admire. And with the Dalai Lama. And I think I, Obama and the Dalai Lama, Obama and the Lama. But I think I admire Obama because of his calm in the midst of strife and his ability to always be rational and to go the to to find the middle ground and with the dalai lama i just admire his kindness and his sense of humor and how he can bring that to every single situation so we have a comment here from pat and she says what if there is a right answer <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of I, that <laughs> i think that we all get to decide what's right for us in these moments. And um, so many factors go into that. I mentioned a few of them, your own background, your upbringing, the people who influenced you, the teachers, the reading that you've done. This obviously is an audience that treasures books and literature and reading. We can always take a book and use it as a time machine, as a simulator to put ourselves in that story. I mentioned Atticus Finch and To Kill a Mockingbird. It's a book that everyone reads when they're 14 years old. Wrong answer. We had to give that book to people to read when they're 40 years old. That's when they can understand it and appreciate it and deeply feel the courage and the integrity of Atticus Finch, who defends a, a black man falsely accused of rape in a flawed judicial system in the 1930s. It's a novel about race in America. It's a novel about a young woman, his daughter Scout, coming of age. It's a novel of integrity and moral courage in the face of overwhelming pressure to cave in. Do you think that sounds like America in the 21st century? Boy, I do. So reading can be part of your journey to a right answer. And then finally, your own experiences in life will tell you where True North is. I wrote a book a few years ago called Sailing True North, and it's about character. It's about that small hinge of the human heart that the big doors of our lives swing on. Big doors swing on small hinges. So yes, there's a right answer, but here's the punchline. You get to pick what it is in the cases that we discuss in this book. I love that. Thank you. Um, so someone out there would like to know if you could tell us a little bit about the Captain Phillips story. Sure. I'd love to. So um, many of you will have seen the movie. And if you have not seen the movie, when we're done with this uh, broadcast, you should click over and watch Captain Phillips. It's an amazing story. And it, it happens in 2009 off the coast of East Africa. A big, huge tanker, the Maersk, Alabama, is sailing along and Somali pirates board it. They capture it. 
the captain, Captain Phillips, Richard Phillips, very courageously says, let my crew go. I will be your hostage. They agree to that because they don't want to try and control this entire crew. So now they hold the captain hostage. The United States Navy is tasked by the president with rescuing Captain Phillips. Enter our heroine, Michelle Howard. She's a brand new one star, one star admiral, rear admiral, not terribly experienced in this type of thing. African-American, first African-American woman to become a one star admiral. You think she's carrying a little burden with that? And she is so steady. You mentioned a moment ago, Christina, uh, President Obama. We always, as senior military who worked for Obama, we called him no drama Obama. And Michelle Howard's like that, very calm, very steady. And what Michelle does beautifully in this book, and this is the lesson for us, any of us, in a crisis, she brings all the tools at her disposal together. She brings SEALs, our national mission force. She brings Navy destroyers who have the big decks. She has a, a big command and control ship. She is negotiating back to Washington, but she is the on-scene commander. She is responsible for how this is going to come out. And she delegates, puts all this capability in place. And from the rocking deck of a destroyer, three Navy snipers take out three Somali pirates, one, two, three. It's an extraordinary shot, very difficult military feat. Captain Phillips is rescued. The lesson of her story is, and it's the one you mentioned about President Obama, stay calm in a crisis, bring the tools you have together, don't be afraid to delegate, and when the time comes, take your shot. Thank you. Um, Christy Toronto would like to know, can you share a specific story in your life when you had to make a difficult decision? Sure, I'll give you two. Uh, one from a very young Stavridis and one from a more, shall we say, mature Stavridis. Um, when I was uh, 28, 29 years old, I was um, embarked, uh, I was an operations officer in a cruiser, a guided missile cruiser, and we were operating in the Arabian Gulf, and our mission was to keep the Strait of Hormuz open so oil tankers could pass in and out of that strait. It was in the uh, mid-1980s, I would say. During that period, I was the tactical action officer, meaning I had control of the firing key on that cruiser. I was the one who would say, yes, we can launch a missile, or no, we will not launch a missile. During one of our patrols, I saw an incoming aircraft on the radar, which looked to me like possibly an Iranian fighter coming to attack my warship. And I agonized, and this is a split second decision. I had less than three minutes to make this decision. I looked at the profile of that aircraft and I thought initially I'm going to shoot it down. I'm going to turn that firing key and shoot down this enemy aircraft. Then something, some intuition, change your mind. One of the lessons here hit me and I pulled back. I did not take the shot. I put my ship at risk. I put my life at risk. Turns out that aircraft was an Iranian commercial aircraft. It was an Airbus aircraft with 200 civilians on board. I chose not to take that shot. It was the right decision because I changed my mind in the middle of that moment. Tragically, less than a year later, another Navy cruiser, USS Vincennes, a different tactical action officer, turned that firing key, shot down what he thought was an incoming enemy aircraft. Turns out it was an Iran Air Airbus, killed 150 innocent civilians. One of the darkest days in the history of the Navy. Lesson for me, 
don't be afraid to change your mind, even in the moment of crisis. Um, that was one moment. The second, well known to everybody, was the Pentagon 9-11. So on 9-11, I went into work. I was a brand new, like Michelle Howard, who I just talked about, a brand new one-star admiral in the Navy. Uh, my uniform was so new, you could look at the gold braid on the sleeve and it was bright and shiny uh, for that brand new one-star admiral, rear admiral, Jim Stavridis. I went into the Pentagon thinking just another beautiful September day. And uh, later that morning, of course, the aircraft hit the Pentagon. I was 150 feet, 50 yards from the strike point of the aircraft. I saw the aircraft hit the Pentagon from the fifth floor of the Pentagon. I'm here talking to you because the aircraft hit the second floor of the Pentagon, going down, obviously. So I was spared. In that moment, after the strike, everything was full of fire and smoke. Like many Navy personnel, we're all trained as firefighters. Because, you know, if you're on a ship and there's a fire, you can't, like, go across the street and watch it burn out. You have to put out the fire. So Navy personnel are trained as firefighters. We charge the fire. We had no masks. We had no hoses. We had a few wall-mounted fire extinguishers. It was a brave but useless effort. We retreated from the fire, went outside onto the grass outside the Pentagon. Then the true heroes of the day, the police, the first responders, the firemen, the EMTs showed up. We tried to help. We tried to support them. What I learned from that moment is that wherever you are in your life, you can think, I'm on top of the world. I'm wearing my Admiral Star. It's a beautiful day in the Pentagon. And suddenly, everything can change. Here I was in the Pentagon. I was in the safest place in the world, right? I'm surrounded by five massive concrete walls. I'm guarded by the strongest military on Earth. I'm in the capital of the richest country on the planet. Was I safe that day? No. Everything can change forever in an instant in your life. Be ready. That was the lesson I took from 9-11. And you can drop a plumb line from that day in my life to this book to risk it all. Be ready. Do you have any techniques that you use in order to, to be ready? Um, you mentioned a moment ago the Dalai Lama. Um, I think a, a very fundamental technique, if you will, is to work very hard in your life to keep things in perspective, to be calm. If that means meditation, if that means ensuring you have sufficient sleep, if that means you have a reasonable level of physical fitness, that you have a healthy diet. I think all of those factors help prepare you for a moment of extreme stress, of extreme challenge and decision making. Number two, and we've talked about it, study the stories of others who have been in these moments. And um, that's the essence of the book, is to introduce nine individuals who have faced these moments of extreme stress what did they do? And you can learn all that by reading the book, To Risk It All. And then number three, and I talked about it again a moment ago, be ready in the sense of recognizing that circumstances can change suddenly. Be alert. Have your head up. Listen. Be prepared. Look. Be smart about your environment. I think those are three things that can help as you get ready. And God forbid anybody should be in one of these circumstances, but too many of us are. 
be ready when the moment comes. Thank you. Um, a question from Edward Ryan. Since you also have a background in academia, if you were to write a leader's bookshelf for academia, are there a handful of books you would start with that, that would be indifferent or addition to those in the bookshelf? <laughs> what a great question. Um, what, what Edward is referring to is one of my previous books is called The Leader's Bookshelf, 50 Books to Be a Leader. And it, it's a compendium of 50, I think, pretty terrific books about how we become better leaders. In terms of specific books that relate to academe, and, and I spent five years as the dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, I was actually offered a job in Miami as dean of the Rosenstiel School of Oceanography at the University of Miami. Um, right as I was finishing up my four-star job in Miami, uh, Donna Shalala was the president of the U. I really wanted to do that. And Bob Gates uh, grabbed me and said, nope, Stavridis, you're going to Europe. You're going to be our Supreme Allied Commander. So in another life, Edward, I would have had that opportunity to, to continue on in, in higher education. I loved my five years as dean. Um, in terms of the books in uh, the leader's bookshelf, I think that's a pretty good list, frankly, overall. Um, I, I would have to reach deep to think of another couple of books, but I'll I'll give you um, I'll give you two that I think could be added to the leader's bookshelf that have a, a particular window into the world of academe. Um, one is by Henry Kissinger, who of course is famous for his statement when he was asked, well, why are the fights in the ivory tower so vicious? He said, because the stakes are so small. And I think that's a, a funny backhanded line, particularly from Kissinger, who really was shaped by the ivory tower in so many, so many ways. So the book I'll give you comes out this summer. I just had the privilege of reviewing it um, and the review will come out in a couple of weeks. It's Henry Kissinger's latest and tragically perhaps his last book. I think he's 98 years old. And it's a book called simply Leadership. And it profiles six great world leaders that he knew very personally. And it, it, it is full of lessons, I think, that um, really capture what we ought to do in a life and what we ought to do as leaders. And the second one, you know, kind of has a, a funny title. It's Stoner, um, like stone, stoner. And the book is about a professor, um, a, a college professor in the Midwest who devotes his life to his students. And it's by uh, Robert Wilson. And it's just a beautifully realized portrait of a quietly lived life that really matters deeply as a teacher. And I'll add just one third a work of literature. It's not a book, but it's a, a play. Um, and it's the screenplay, A Man for All Seasons by Robert Bolt. And it's, a, it's an extraordinary film um, about Sir Thomas More. And in the, in the screenplay, Moore, who is a counselor, kind of a, he's effectively the prime minister to Henry VIII, who ultimately has him beheaded. Uh, Moore is talking to his very ambitious son-in-law, Roper, and um, they're talking about what his son-in-law might do with his life. And Roper says to uh, Sir Thomas More, well, what should I do? And Moore says, well, you could be a teacher. And Roper says, but if I were a teacher, no one would know. And Moore says, well, you would know. Your students would know. Your family would know. God would know. Not a bad audience. 
I think that's the essence for me of what I value of the academy. It is the experience of teaching and of shaping the gorgeous trajectory of the young lives of these students. I think too often teaching plays a bit of second fiddle to research and writing articles for very specialized journals and becoming involved in the administration of a university. These are worthy pursuits, but they don't remotely approach the impact or the importance of teaching. So if I could say one thing that I took away from five years as a dean to faculty everywhere, to deans everywhere, to provosts everywhere, to university presidents everywhere, cherish the teachers, cherish the teachers. Thank you. Um, from Helen, um, a comment. Hello, Admiral. You were the best commanding general during my years at USAG Miami. The programs you introduced were so important and positive. Thank you. From Helen. Gosh, that's, that's so kind, Helen. I, I know exactly who you are. And I loved my time in Miami, for me, it was like coming home. You know, born in South Florida, I speak Spanish, I'm, I speak French, I'm studying Portuguese at the moment. I'm very comfortable in Latin America and the Caribbean. Y por mis amigos que hablan español, muy, muy gracias por su presencia el noche y gracias por su ayuda con mi libro. And I, I'm so happy to be remembered as a commander of the U.S. Southern Command. Thank you. Qué maravilla. Que hablas español <laughs> también. Oh, my gosh. Um, from Roger, should the U.S. and allies escort grain from Odessa? Thank you for that question. The answer <laughs> is emphatically yes. Just to put everyone on the same sheet of music here, we have a war in Ukraine. I think that has not escaped anybody's notice, but a, a, a portion of the impact of that war is the fact that Ukraine produces 20% of the world's grains, sunflower oil, fertilizers, enormously important agrarian products. Russia has illegally, and it is war criminal behavior blockaded the coast of Ukraine in the Black Sea. Therefore, all of that grain, all of that sunflower oil, all of that fertilizer cannot get out. Therefore, it does not end up in its intended markets in most prominently North Africa, Middle East, already unstable regions who are now gonna have a massive food security problem. So we ought to crack that blockade, my opinion, and we ought to do it not only because it's the right thing to do for Ukraine, not only because it says to Russia, you cannot violate international law like this, but most importantly for the humanitarian value of getting the grain out. So how do we do that specifically? I know a fair amount about this because as I alluded to a moment ago, in the 1980s, young Lieutenant Stavridis, when I had great hair, just like Christina. Um, in those days, I was um, escorting oil tankers in and out of the Arabian Gulf through the Strait of Hormuz, which the Iranians were blockading. Now we have the Russians blockading. We ought to take the same approach as follows. We ought to take grain tankers, flag them, register them, make them U.S. merchant ships and put a U.S. Navy guided missile destroyer alongside each one of them and drive them into Odessa, load up the grain and take the grain out. You would pass through Ukrainian waters and international waters. You wouldn't get near Russian waters. Russia would have no motive, no legal right, and frankly would dare attack a U.S. Navy warship escorting a grain cargo. That's how we do it. We should break that blockade. It's an active conversation at the moment. 
Personally, I think one of two things will happen over the next six weeks. Either Vladimir Putin will recognize that we're going to do that, in which case he'll kind of take the high road, if you will, and say, I've decided to let the grain go in and out. I'll be fine with that. Or if he continues this blockade, we ought to undertake the measures I just described, get the grain out, and double our efforts to give the Ukrainians the surface-to-surface -surface missiles that they need to attack the Russian Black Sea Fleet. I'll close with this. The Ukrainians have already sunk the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Remarkable achievement. You know, I went four years to the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. I forgot most of it. But one thing I remember them telling me is, don't lose your flagship. Russia's already lost the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet. There's a lot more damage in store for that fleet if Putin doesn't get out of the way and let that grain pass. So thank you for the question. It's a good one. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, we should close, um, as you mentioned, um, but maybe just like some final thoughts, if I could get from you. For those of us um, who might feel a sense of hopelessness a little bit or helplessness in the face of everything that's going on in our country lately, um, do you have any, any advice for us? I do, Christina, and, and I'll, I'll start with some advice for the country and I'll conclude with some advice for each of us. My, my advice for the country is that we have become polarized, we become highly divided, that does not serve us well. I think we all know that on both sides of this equation, whether you get up in the morning with Morning Joe and wrap it up with Rachel Maddow, or you're listening to Fox and Friends and finishing up with Sean Hannity at night. And by the way, I'm a centrist. I'm a registered independent, neither a Democrat nor a Republican. I was vetted for vice president by Hillary one of six people actually vetted by the campaign. I was subsequently offered a cabinet post by Donald Trump. I think of that as two bullets whizzing by my head at very close range. My point is I'm a centrist. And I think for all of us, we need to think hard about how divided the country is and work to try and reach across the aisles. Go to places where you are not comfortable, have conversations with those with whom you disagree. And part of that, I think, is celebrating what we can agree upon. And one thing we can agree upon is service. And here I mean not military and veterans and thank you for your service, that's very kind. I'm talking about the big idea of service, serving the country as a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, a police, a fireman, an emergency medical technician, a diplomat, a Peace Corps volunteer, Teach for America, Volunteer for America. There are so many ways to serve this country. We had to celebrate and incentivize service. And secondly, we had to work very hard to find candidates who want to reach across the aisle, and they exist, centrists. And here I'm not making a political statement. I'm merely pointing out that in our political life in this country, we ought to value those who can work with the other side. And we have the power. We own the ballot box. We must use that to bring candidates who are not polarizing, but who bring us together. And then finally, on a, I, I hope a, a good way to end the conversation, um, for all of us, my advice is do not take counsel of your fears. The world can be very frightening, but as you look around you, find the joy in the quiet moments, in your family, in your laughter, in your small achievements and your small defeats. Keep them in perspective. I spent many, many years at sea and when I would go up to the bridge of the ship and I'd look in the distance at the horizon, you see a point where the sea meets the sky. And I would often ask myself when I was young, what am I looking at? And 
over time, I realized that I was looking at eternity, that I was looking at the fact that all of us are here for a short period of time. We should do what we can for others. We should keep our lives in perspective. And above all, we should be kind to each other. If we do those small things, I think together we can find our way out of this dark thicket into which we have wandered. Thank, Thank you very much. That is very beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and for your work and your spirit and um, your own service. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. To everyone watching, I'll just remind you, you can order the book from Books and Books uh, by just going to the green link at the bottom of the screen, or you can come into any of our stores and we have it there as well. And we hope that we're going to see you in person very soon. Um, right? <laughs> good. And That's um, a deal. Good, good, good. Well, then, thank you very much to everyone. Thanks for supporting Books and Books. And have a great evening. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Much love to the Magic City. Bye-bye.